happened to have strong Scandinavian links. Ship burials like this have only been found in Suffolk and Sweden. The helmet looked Swedish too, like this one, the Vendel 14 helmet from Upland with its ear flaps and eyebrows. But a closer look at the Sutton Hoo helmet showed some important differences. A Sutton Hoo helmet has been raised from a piece of iron, just hammered up, the cap is in one whole piece, whereas the construction of the Swedish helmets show that they were made from several different bands of iron. And therefore, we now think it's possible that the helmet was actually made in England. An English helmet may be, but one crowded with images taken from Scandinavian mythology, like these dancing warrior panels. Each warrior is dragging a foot and holds spears and a short sword. They seem to be doing some kind of ritual movement. Of course, they could be fighting, but we do have parallels for that in Scandinavia. So this is obviously a motif. I think what we're looking at here is a repertoire of images, and clearly they're very potent images of power. You have warriors on a helmet and clearly successful warriors, and they must be to do with the mythology and the traditions and the conferring of power and success in battle. There was one other group of mighty warriors who influenced this helmet. The Romans had left Britain at the beginning of the 5th century, but their influence was still being felt a century or two later. This fallen warrior design, where the man on horseback is riding over the conquered enemy, has its roots in the Roman period, and the helmet shape itself borrows heavily from Roman parade helmets. These early Anglo-Saxon kingdoms are really interesting because, uh, as far as we can tell, um, they were just successful warriors who established their dynasties in Britain, having uh, migrated from Scandinavia in the late Roman period. Of course, later on, when they became powerful, these kings like Offa in Mercia, who built the great dike between England and Wales, or these people in East Anglia, they like to claim that they had a great descent going back even to kings before. The dynasty goes back to Caesar, and then ultimately to Woden. Um, having a, a, a Germanic god as the uh, progenitor of your dynasty is not uncommon, actually, amongst the early Anglo-Saxon dynasties. But it's very interesting that the East Anglian genealogy also includes uh, Caesar in it. And that, to me, is really rather interesting because one of the strands in this extraordinary burial is a strand which seems to be saying we are the heirs of Rome. The helmet itself is based on a Roman parade helmet, very clearly. So that in itself is a sort of evocation of the Roman past. So the fact that Caesar appears in the genealogy, I think, is no accident at all. They come from the pagan world of Odin and Thor, Woden and Freya, and the, these pagan gods of war and storm in, in the Viking northern world that we're familiar with later, you know. Um, but they also adopt Roman ideas of uh, rulership, of kingship, perhaps, uh, some of the symbolism of their kingship, and subsequently, of course, Roman religion uh, and uh, Latin culture. The late Roman inheritance included Christianity. Bede tells us that a missionary landed on the island of Thanet in Kent in 597. He talks about King Redwald, who spent quite a bit of time in Kent and were therefore have come into contact with Christianity there, having adopted Christianity, but on returning to his kingdom had reverted to paganism, or at least had gone halfway back to being a pagan because he had altars, according to be placed side by side, one to Christ and one to the devil, which presumably meant the Germanic god Woden. So, so Redwald seems to be backing two horses uh, at that time. It's possible that the family of the dead man also decided to back two horses when they came to assemble the grave goods. Although it was a pagan burial with provision made for the pagan afterlife, Two silver baptismal spoons with the Greek inscriptions Solos and Polos were also included. Baptismal spoons, of course, are, are, are given at conversion and baptism, you know, and these had, it seemed, you know, Solos and Polos, Saul and Paul, you know, the famous conversion of uh, uh, the Apostle Paul in, in the New Testament. And even though he converted back to paganism and was buried in a pagan graveyard, his family 
nevertheless buried these things with him. The spoons, with their Greek inscriptions, were found at the right shoulder of where the body might have lain. The pagan helmet was at the left shoulder. The helmet does not contain any Christian symbolism. In contrast, this 8th century helmet found in York carries an emphatic Christian message. Its crest forms a cross shape, and there is a Latin inscription, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit and God, to all we say, Amen. That Christian inscription on the York helmet is perhaps doing what these extraordinary totemic images or mythological images, whatever they are, are doing on the Sutton Hoo helmet. The Christian invocation, the Christian prayer on the York helmet is bringing protection to its wearer. And so I think perhaps these fascinating animal images uh, on the crest and on the face mask of the Sutton Hoo helmet might be doing for the wearer of the Sutton Hoo helmet. The discovery of the Sutton Hoo treasure turned Anglo-Saxon scholarship on its head, bringing with it a new understanding of how sophisticated their culture was. Just by looking at this grave assemblage, we realised that there were international connections, that goods and probably also people could travel very long distances and very far beyond their own cultures. If you look at the eyebrows, the garnets used on those may have come from as far away as India or Sri Lanka. So you see that the materials themselves had travelled quite a long distance before reaching Anglo-Saxon England. What's more, it seemed to prove something that few people dared to believe was possible. It gave a reality to that great masterpiece of early English literature, the epic poem Beowulf, which described the great deeds and death of a heroic king from the 7th century. There's a great description in, in Beowulf of the helmet, Sehuita helm, the, the white shining helm, maybe it's silvered or whatever, uh, made by the mastery of a gold master who worked wonders so long ago. You know, this is, uh, this is the world of Beowulf. In the poem, it's referred to the fact that the helmet has got what is called a walla. It is something that is wirum bewundum, wound with wire, and it somehow goes around the helmet. Well, we didn't have any idea what that was until it was realised that this would fit exactly as a description, the crest that we have on the Sutton Hoo helmet. The discovery of the treasure in July 1939 made headline news. Interest in is only intensified when a treasure trove inquiry decided that everything from the grave belonged to Mrs. Pretty, who had funded the excavation and on whose land it had been found. In an act of unparalleled generosity, she promptly gave all this extraordinary treasure to the British Museum. She was offered the honour of Dame of the British Empire, but refused it. Within a fortnight of the treasure trove inquest, war had broken out. Amazingly, Scenes like this were played out on the burial mound. Once war was declared, this area, of, which is called Sutton Heath, was used for battle practice. And the tanks and Bren gun carriers drove all over these mounds. During the time when it was used for battle practices, actually tanks drove right through the ship. So when it was re-excavated, you could actually see where the, the tanks' tracks had driven over the remains of the ship. London too was under attack and the British Museum moved many of its treasures to a London underground station. The helmet, still in over 500 pieces, was boxed up and stored here. At the end of the war, the huge job began of piecing it back together, which took two years. This was the outcome which was proudly displayed in the Festival of Britain in 1951. I declare the Festival of Britain open and wish it a universal success. The Festival of Britain was absolutely an act of regeneration after the war and it was there to say look here we are we're back in business and this is what we stand for these are British values this is our British history this is our past and it's something which we should be very proud of. There in ration book Britain rather pinched this artifact was displayed and an artifact which in the conventional narrative of English history and even British history represented a kind of beginning, you know. The, the, the story of the monarchy leading into the story of the empire all went back to this. Despite all the attention the helmet was getting,
There was a growing sense of unease about the way it had been put back together. It didn't actually function as a helmet, and the sides of the face and the throat would have been left completely unprotected. More than that, because the crest and the terminal dragon overlapped the neck guard, the neck guard wasn't flexible, which would have meant that when you wore it, you were like almost imprisoned in it. All these things gradually led to the helmet being dismantled and then being put together again, which was like opening a little box of horrors. In 1971, the reassembling started and British Museum conservator Nigel Williams was given the job. For over six months, the helmet lay in over 500 fragments on Williams' work table. A colleague remembers the blood, sweat and frustrations involved. He was an optimistic man. He probably thought, oh, three weeks I'll have something to show. <laughs> it, it, it was really quite wrong. It, it took him a very long time. Uh, and uh, what slowed him up, of course, was everything. It was such an important helmet, pretty well everything had to be discussed. This does slow you down. You can't just go at it. Although I do remember Nigel saying to him, I wish these people would get out of my room and let me get on with it. Then an astounding breakthrough was made. In a box marked head, he found the jaw of a dragon head, similar to those at either end of the crest. It hadn't been used on the original reconstruction. That little head lay around for a while. At that time, I think he'd been looking at it for about eight months. So gradually, you begin to absorb, sort of subconsciously, the, the, the shapes of things. And it's when your eye catches one and looks at another, suddenly you say, that'll fit there. I mean, you almost know, you pick it up and it'll go. You, you, do, you very nearly don't need to try it. Yeah, that'll fit there, yes. Fine, ding, oh, it does. This third dragon head is a perfect fit between the eyebrows, interlocking with the other elements of the face. It also revealed another layer of symbolism in the helmet. Suddenly, the features of the face mask materialised into the shape of a winged dragon. The eyebrows appear as wings, while the nose and moustache form the body and the tail. This is at once a human face and yet a face which has animal strength embodied in the symbolism of, of this mask, um, and which uh, is also not only something which embodies the power of the wearer, but perhaps also terrifies the seer. I think the helmet has become an icon. That helmet has a sort of reality for people because they can look at it and see the early 7th century, see those early Anglo-Saxon warriors and how they perceived themselves. Nearly 1,500 years after it was made, the Sutton Hoo helmet has taken its place in the British Museum as one of its supreme treasures. Discovered on the eve of war, it became a symbol of the nation and proof of a forgotten, sophisticated civilization. It's an object in the museum's collections like no other. We may never know who made it and we can't be certain who wore it, but it still has the power to make us think again about our nation.